Okay, this is the final video in our response to Jews for Judaism um, segment. So, so now we're going to listen to the Rabbi Skolbeck sum up his arguments, and then I will sum up my arguments, and uh, we'll see where we end up. So let's listen to the rabbi first. Let me conclude. We began today by sharing that it's significant, it is significant that the New Testament only succeeded by gluing itself on to the Old Testament to give it credibility. It was a mark of brilliance by the church to take their Bible and to stick it onto the back of the Jewish Bible. And now they have the Bible with all the authority and history and significance of the Jewish scriptures. It's funny that in his book, Josh McDowell speaks about how do we know the Bible is true. One of the things he does is he shows how prophecy is fulfilled. And where are the prophecies that he shows that were fulfilled? Prophecies from the Jewish Bible. So here he has what makes the Bible true. All the prophecies are filled. Where do they come from? The Jewish Bible. How does his Bible get in there? It sneaks in on the coattails of the Jewish Bible. Yet, and listen to me carefully, without the New Testament, without the Christian Bible, it's very clear that the Old Testament would not be as well known in the world today. Maimonides wrote hundreds of years ago that it could be that as part of God's inscrutable plan to bring about the ultimate redemption of the world, God allowed for the spread of Christianity and Islam, which took Jewish ideas and spread them to the rest of the world, basically preparing the world for when the true Messiah finally comes. Because had Christianity and Islam not spread Jewish ideas to the world, and the Messiah would show up in a pagan world, they would not even notice it. It would be irrelevant. But we live in a world today where the two major religions in the world are competitive religions to Judaism. They basically are in great tension with Judaism. These are two religions that are built on the claim that even though Judaism was once true, it's all been changed with their religion. But we have this reliance in Christianity and Islam on Judaism. We're the foundation. And so Maimonides suggests that when the, final, when the Messiah finally comes, it will be a concept that the world will understand and recognize. And the world will be able to say, oh, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. But without the world being primed and readied for this, by not what we're doing, we don't run around spreading, you know, we don't distribute Old Testaments in Nigeria. But the competitive religions to Judaism are spreading their teachings, which in many ways are Jewish teachings and Jewish ideas. And so one day, and it's happening now, the world is beginning, as Isaiah said, turning to our light. The Bible says we're to be a light unto the nations, and Isaiah promises one day the world will turn to our light. And the prophet Zechariah says in his eighth chapter that one day ten people from every nation of the world will grab hold of a Jew and they're going to say, we want to follow you because we've heard God is with you. And that is happening today as increasing numbers of Christians by studying their Bible and studying the Jewish Bible are coming to realize, you know what? It doesn't add up. You can't fit this square peg into a round hole. And therefore, we now have hundreds and thousands of Christians every day now turning to rabbis, turning to Jewish teachers and saying, you know what, we finally realized you guys are right all along. Please teach us. First of all, the New Testament is only succeeded because of the Old Testament, because they stuck it onto the back of the Old Testament. And that's true. It's absolutely true because the New Testament is the New Covenant, as we've already explained in Jeremiah. 
uh, there is an old covenant and a new covenant. So how could you have a new covenant without having an old covenant? And Jesus, when Jesus walked the earth, he taught the Old Testament. He taught the scriptures. The apostles taught the scriptures. And so the, the New Testament is the uh, re recording of the Jesus and the Apostles teaching the Old Testament. So of course they have to be added together. How could you possibly understand what they're teaching if you don't look at what they're teaching? So it, it, it's a reinterpretation of the Old Testament. That's what Christianity is. And that is part of what God's judgment was upon ancient Israel. As, um, you know, that they, they, kept, they, they kept going back into paganism. And they kept not uh, doing God's ways. Some people did God's ways all along. There was always a remnant doing God's ways. But the majority... Uh, would always revert back into the pagan ways. And part of God's judgment was uh, that he will send them off and uh, end their kingdoms and end their culture. But he brought Judah back, uh, or the, the kingdom of Judah back, in order to fulfill his promise to David and in order to fulfill his purpose. It had nothing to do with them. It was all about him and what his purpose was. And he brought them back in order to continue on with his plan of bringing the Redeemer, Jesus, into the world. And so, and this is all, all borne out in prophecy in the Old and New Testament. So it's not hard to see once you see it. And so, you know, the, 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 the reinterpretation of the Torah, it's not really a reinterpretation. It was like um, they had their certain interpretation of it. And, and the, the New Testament is in there, but it was not revealed. It's the kind of thing that you're not going to see it until it all comes together. And then it's revealed, and then you go, ah. So he's, he told this story right from the beginning. Um, but nobody realized what the story was right from the beginning. So that's part of God showing... His authority and power is from the beginning he knew what he was going to do but nobody else understood it and now we can read these stories that are thousands of years old that speak about Christ who came thousands of years later and that thousands of years before him the story was told about him and then he came and fulfilled the story so, of course, it, it, it's, the two books are attached together because they belong together. Now, what was another thing? There are only prophecies fulfilled in the Tanakh. So, this rabbi is trying to tell us that uh, all the prophecies that are fulfilled are only the ones in the Tanakh, and the New Testament doesn't have any prophecies that are fulfilled. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of prophecies fulfilled that are prophecies of the New Testament. Um, Jesus gave many, many prophecies about the Jews and about the, uh, their kingdom being taken from them and given to another, which actually happened. Uh, he said uh, of the temple, he said, a stone shall not be left upon a stone. And, and all shall be thrown down, and that happened. Um, there's uh, 
the apostles gave many prophecies. There's, there's like the Antichrist prophecies. A lot of that has come true. Um, I'm not going to dive deep into that right now. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of New Testament prophecies that have happened, and what the what the New Testament tends to do, and and some of the Old Testament prophets do this also, is they they uh, recycle older prophecies. So they will uh, like the Revelation. It has probably three hundred references to Old Testament prophecies. And what it's doing is it's putting them in such an order to say, okay, now that the Messiah has been revealed, and now that we have this new teaching and this new way of looking at it, now we're going to put the prophecies into some order and some relation to this that all is being revealed. There, there are no more secrets. Before Jesus came, there was there was somewhat of a secret, like a covering, saying, um, I don't want you to know yet what I'm going to exactly do, but I'm telling you what I'm going to do, but you're not really going to get it yet. And now that Jesus has come, now it's plainly being shown. All things are being revealed. So that's the difference. And so it does talk a lot about the Old Testament prophecies because it's showing you, uh, it's now revealing to you what was there, what was said from the beginning. So yeah, there's a lot of New Testament prophecy. He just doesn't study the New Testament. It's pretty obvious. He, he, um, he doesn't really know a lot about the New Testament. And he's just sort of picking out things to say bad about it. Uh, that's pretty common in religion for people to do that. Now, uh, the other thing he talked about, the ultimate redemption of the world is comes from Judaism. And that somehow God used Christianity and Islam to spread the message of Judaism. And that's true, yes, uh, that the, the, the great Abrahamic religions all spread the message of God, not the message of Judaism, the message of God. So uh, what do you call Judaism? Uh, rabbinic Judaism. This is their interpretation of God and other people have other interpretations of God. Now um, I could talk a lot about Islamic interpretations of God but that's not really what my channel is about. Um, but I, I will kind of stick with the, the um, Mainly Christian interpretations of history is what the channel is really about. But this particular segment is relating to answering what the Jews for Judaism group is talking about. So uh, we're, we're going to stick with Jews and Christians for this, ch this particular video. Now... Um, as far as, okay, so yeah, uh, God did use Christianity and, and Islam to spread his message around the world. Um, you know, the, 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 the dominant nations of the world are Christian. And that is also a prophecy. Uh, there are many prophecies related to that. Um, the Christian nations, you could, in, in the Tanakh, you could basically, in a nutshell, sum them up as Ephraim. Ephraim. The lost ten tribes has become the Christian nations. Now, that doesn't mean that God is spreading rabbinic Judaism around the world. Rabbinic Judaism 
is uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in the end of the video. We'll get into that more. So now, oh, now also he says once what once was true is changed according to Christ and Islam. Okay, so they're saying, well, you know, the, the Torah was the truth, and now they come up with a reinterpretation of the truth. It's, it's not a reinterpretation, it's a realization of the truth. The, 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 some of the, the, the main truths that I can point out is uh, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, now th this is a Christian interpretation would be Abraham represents the father, Isaac represents the, the son whom the father was willing to sacrifice, but didn't really sacrifice him because he lived. Okay, Jacob is the man transformed by the power of God and given a new name, Israel. So there you have a Christian message. Okay, another Christian message. Moses was given the law of God and he, he gave the law of God to the people, but he did not enter the promised land. It was Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua, same name, Jesus. Okay, so it was Yeshua, or Jesus, who led the people into the Promised Land and conquered the enemy. So this is a Christian message. These are the Christian messages that could never be realized until Christ came and gave the Gospel. Uh, that, those are two examples of hundreds of, of examples. Okay. Um, now, what's another one? Uh, the world is being primed for a revelation. And, okay, so the rabbi um, claims that the revelation is going to be a revelation of rabbinic Judaism. Uh, well, we, di we disagree. We, we have disagreements on these things. That doesn't... Uh, make all other arguments useless and pointless. It's uh, there's disagreement over over the interpretation. Now he uh, he pointed out uh, a pro uh, a prophecy, the one where he said ten people of the nations will dra grab a Jew by the skirt and say. We will follow you because we heard that God is with you. So we'll take a look at that one. And that's Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. Okay. Let's see. Now Zechariah has a lot of uh, prophecies. We want to, this is where we can talk a little more about what I said I would talk about later. So, Zechariah appeared early on in the Second Temple period. So, for those who don't know, uh, the First Temple was built by Solomon, who was the son of David. And that temple ended up being destroyed by the king of Babylon in 586 BC. And this was a judgment from God, that it would be destroyed and the people would be taken to Babylon, and after 70 years, he would bring them back to rebuild, rebuild the city and the temple. Um, you'll find that in Daniel chapter 9, I suppose, would be uh, the prophecy that the temple would be rebuilt. Um, Isaiah is, and Ezekiel, I believe, give the 70 years, Jeremiah would give the 70 year period that they, they would come back after 70 years. So then, uh, so the people were sent off to Babylon 
and after 70 years there was a decree made in, by a Persian king that uh, they could come back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. So they came back, but not all of the Jews came back. Only a small remnant of the Jews came back to build the city and the temple. The rest of them all stayed in Babylon. They didn't want to come back. They liked Babylon. They had lives in Babylon. A lot of them were born in Babylon. They had jobs. They had houses. They had, they were doing pretty well over there in Babylon. So a lot of them didn't want, they didn't return. There was a small number of them, a small percentage returned to Jerusalem. And that's the story of Nehemiah and Ezra. And they were persecuted by the people that were living there already while they rebuilt the temple. And Zechariah is one of the prophets that was sent to these people who were rebuilding the temple. Okay? And God was not exactly pleased with those who refused to return. He didn't have wonderful things to say about those who stayed in Babylon. So now we have the Jews are in two groups, those who stayed in Babylon and those who moved back to Jerusalem. Now those who moved back to Jerusalem, there's a whole history there from Jerusalem that, that the history goes on through the Maccabean period, through the Herodian dynasty, and up until the time of Christ, where then the temple and, and Judea was overthrown by the Romans in 70 AD. And the, the Jews of Babylon also have a history that there was a Jewish community in Babylon through that whole period, right from the time that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in 586 BC, Jews had had this community in Babylon, which lasted right up until 1948, when the Arab nations expelled the Jews from the Arab nations, and they moved to Israel. Okay, so there was this Jewish community in Babylon, the Jewish community in Jerusalem were the two biggest communities. And there was also other communities and many other places. So that's where they have the two Talmuds. Uh, a Talmud is a rabbi's commentary on the Bible, is the most simple, simplest way to understand it. So there's a Babylonian Talmud. That's from the Babylonian rabbis. And there's a Jerusalem Talmud. That's from the Jerusalem rabbis, and is their interpretation of the Bible. So what does God say about these two communities? That's a good question. All right. So Zechariah, he talks a lot about that. He, he, and I'm not going to dive into it right here. And there, there, a lot of Jews are going to completely disagree with what I'm saying anyway. It's Christian interpretation. Um, but I will point you to, uh, well, if you look at the flying roll uh, prophecy in, in Zechariah chapter 5, the woman is taken up into a basket, and her name is Wickedness, and she is given a place in Shinar, to, on a pedestal, to sit on a pedestal in Shinar. Shinar is Babylon, that's Lower Mesopotamia, Sumer, Shinar, okay, and that is the Jewish community in Babylon, okay, and and it's it's like a it's like a competition for the temple, it it's like an anti-temple. They're living without the temple. They have their interpretation. The Jerusalem 
uh, teachers have their interpretation, you see? So there's a problem there, which Zachariah deals with, okay? And then um, in chapter 6, starting in about verse 9, he speaks about this priest and king named Yeshua. He's a priest and a king. All right? And there's also another um, earlier prophecy about a priest. Yeshua, the high priest. Okay? And then there's another priest who's a priest and a king. So, um, these are uh, very significant. Which I have other videos I made about it. I can't tell you right off out of the top of my head. Uh, it, it, the video is uh, dealing with the two witnesses. The, these two priests in Zechariah are very connected to the two witnesses in Revelation. Okay? So, Zechariah, this is sort of, I'm giving you a little overview of who Zechariah was. He, he was sent to these a uh, small community in Jerusalem rebuilding the temple to encourage them. Okay? And now um, we go to chapter 8, where the rabbi quoted the last verse of chapter 8. And it says, uh, he's talking about the, the, uh, the house of Judah being restored. So what's the house of Judah? Who's the king? Who is the leader of the house of Judah? It's not Judah, the patriarch. It's David. King David is the leader of the house of Judah. This is the Davidic covenant. This is the, the kingdom of David being restored, is what he's talking about. Okay? And he says, uh, let's just start at uh, verse 18. And the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore love the truth and peace. Okay, so the fast, uh, that this is talking about the festivals given through Moses and those festivals if you look at the symbolic meaning behind those festivals they lead to Jesus and to the final redemption of the world it's God's plan laid out okay so these festivals will be joy and gladness to the house of Judah okay Thus says the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the, and the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts in those days, in those days, it shall come to pass that ten men shall take the hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So the, the idea is ten, ten to one. Ten of all different languages will come to one Jew and say, we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. So uh, you can interpret this as all the nations of the world, all the languages coming to one nation, the Jews. Or you could also interpret it, all the nations of the world 
coming to one Jew. And that's what it also, it, it actually says, the ten nations will come to one Jew. Okay, so uh, where do we have an interpretation of that in the Bible? Well, let's take a look at Acts. Chapter 1, chapter 2, um, say, starting in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, this is the apostles, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how do we hear every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What manner is this? What means this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it, and he goes on and on, and he says in uh, that this is David, um, the son of David, being raised from the dead as prophesied. And this is Jesus who God raised up, and we are all witnesses. And, and the, the great number of them began to be converted. So this is the, the giving out of the gospel. So... Who is the one Jew that all the nations will run to, saying, We have heard that God is with you? It's Jesus. He's the Jew. Okay? So, the rabbi, you know, he interprets it because he doesn't believe in Jesus. He interprets it as the Jewish nation... Uh, who are the teachers, the rabbis, and that they are the authority on everything to do with the Tanakh. Where I say that God is the authority. 
on everything to do with the Tanakh. And if you read the Tanakh, and you look at the, the, the prophecies in the Tanakh, and you look at how the New Testament teaches what that means, that it all did come to pass the way that they teach it. And it all is coming to pass. And ever since Jesus, the history since then, has all been prophesied and has all been laid out for us. And we are nearly at the end of it now. So, you know, to come along now and say, well, I'm a rabbi, just because I was, just because I'm a Jew, all of a sudden I'm supposed to know everything. You know, it's like, um, it just doesn't work that way. And then, and then um, with the rabbis, they, they have the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud because this is, um, you know, everything Jewish. And, and these are uh, valuable tools for understanding the Hebrew language and for understanding what they thought of it. But it doesn't necessarily make them right about what they thought of it. Because the Bible itself repeatedly says they were wrong a lot. So um, you have to take it with a grain of salt, you know, and say, okay, what was the, what were the prophets actually talking about? What was the, the Torah actually talking about? And you have to could at least consider the New Testament, Jesus and the Apostles, Consider what they said and compare it to what others have said. So, um, you know, I've, I've no, noted several times how the rabbi leaves things out and how he makes a straw man arguments about Christians. That he doesn't, uh, I hope he doesn't know as much about Christianity as he leads on. Um, I hope that he, it's being done in ignorance and not purposeful, purposefully because uh, he's missing the mark on Christianity completely um, in many ways. So, you know, that's all I can really say. And uh, that's the difference between Christians and Jews. Um, if you find that um, it's the interpretation, the, the perspective on the prophets and on the whole thing, the perspective even on the New Testament, Christians and Jews have a different perspective. And Christians are merely people who read about Jesus and the Apostles and what they say about the Tanakh and listen to what they teach about the Tanakh. And they were Jews. And they lived at the end of the Second Temple period. So they knew what they were talking about also. So, um, and they have a lot to say. And it does um, pan out when you follow along with it and you uh, learn from it. It does pan out. So that's all I can say. Well, so uh, don't forget to like and share and subscribe to help the video and help the algorithms to hit the like button. It doesn't cost anything. It takes one second. And it just helps out the video to, to in the algorithms. Uh, because uh, these types of videos uh, are not the most popular thing in the first place. And they're not exactly lifted up as something by YouTube. Um, so help us out. Hit the like button. Thank you very much.